Continuing on this first chapter on reporting data results, we're going to start with the first one of those guidelines that I was mentioning in the first video. The one that we'll talk about first is data density. So that guideline was to aim for a high data density. Let me start by explaining what data density is. It's the density in terms of how much ink it takes to show a certain amount of data, a certain amount of information. Ideally, you want a data to ink ratio that's very high. You want to be showing a lot of data for not so much ink, if, we can, if you can, or for the smaller amount of ink possible. Um, the way that you can think of ink here is really literally how much ink it would take your printer to put that on the page. So let's take a look at some examples. I have this slide and I have the next slide. In both cases, I've taken two graphs that show the exact same amount of information. So one way to increase the data to ink ratio, to increase the data density, if you're showing the same amount of information is to take away some ink. So let's look at this example. In both cases, this is showing that World Cup data where I have taken and grouped it by the, the position, so midfielder, goalkeeper, etc., and then counted how many players were in each of those categories. So this shows that information. That might be something that you wanted to show for this data set. Here on the left, we have an example of showing that with lower data density. This is using a bar chart. And you can see that the real information we're seeing here is where the bar chart ends. So this was over 200. It looks like somewhere around um, 225. Whereas for goalkeepers, that was by far our least, and that one was less than 50. We're using a lot of ink to create this whole column, though, when really all we need to know is exactly where it ended. If we look here on the right, we're taking that idea to really remove a lot of the ink. So this is only showing a point at the space where we have the count for each of those. We've reduced the amount of ink our printer would need to use, and we're showing things with a much higher data density. The other piece that's going on here is in the background. So you can see that we've got some of these background guidelines and background color, whereas here we've taken some of those out. And in this case, it's still pretty easy for you to be able to go down and see where that lines up. So we've removed some of that ink without really losing a lot of, of helpful background or, or guidelines. Let's look at another example. This is using the data set from um, mortality in Chicago in 1995. This is showing the all-cause mortality going through the month. And you can see, so here we have kind of July 3rd and July 10th and so forth. Uh, so forth going all the way down. And then on the y-axis, it's showing on that specific day how many deaths there were. These two are showing, again, the exact same information, but this one on the left is doing more of kind of like that Excel classic style of a plot where it's filled in everything underneath and then it's added some very dark guidelines in the background and all of that. Whereas this one is quite sparse. Um, it doesn't even have the, the kind of... Um, axes lines, which might be a little bit too far in some cases, but it's also showing packing a lot of information in using very little ink. Now, part of the reason that you want to do this, that you want to try to increase your data density on your plots is because we're going to talk in some of the other guidelines about adding other elements in, adding in things that help you highlight unusual points or adding in different references that help you to interpret the data. If you have a really busy graph that's using a lot of ink to show just your baseline information, you're leaving very little room to add on those elements without it looking really cluttered and being really visually hard to focus on the points that you should focus on. If you use a high data density, you're leaving yourself a lot of room to add on those other elements and really kind of enriching your plot without it looking too overwhelming. One of the easiest ways to work towards this idea in ggplot is to use something called themes. Themes allow you to change a lot of the elements of the plot all at once. It won't affect any of the main elements that we've talked about in uh, the last chapter's lecture. So if you'll recall, the three main components of your plots when you're using ggplot, the three main things we think about are the data, the mapping of aesthetics to different columns in the data set, and then finally, the geoms, the actual geometric points that go on, the geometric objects. 
Themes won't mess with any of those. What the themes do is change some of the elements around the plot. So things like the font of the labeling and the different uh, scale markers and the background of the plot area and the types of axes lines that are used and things like that. So it can change a lot of those elements and help in making the, the plot simpler and use less data while not affecting any of the information that you're showing. Some of the, there are some themes that come with ggplot too. Several that we'll be using a good bit in this class are the classic theme, BW, which stands for black and white, so theme BW, theme minimal, and then theme void. A theme void really takes every element out, and it's not particularly useful for something like a scatter plot, but it turns out it's really useful for when you're creating maps. A lot of times then you want to take out all of the kind of background grid and axis labeling and things like that. These are all in ggplot. So if you go in and do a question mark in ggplot2, and you'll notice they all start it with theme underscore. So if you put in the theme underscore, you can scroll through and see all of these different examples that you can use. And you can feel free to play around with those. I'll show in just a few slides how you can use these to add to your um, to, to a ggplot object you've created. The other place that you can find these are in packages outside of ggplot. So people can write their own code to create their own themes, and several people have, and sometimes they'll put those in a larger package that includes a lot of different things. But there have been a few cases where they've created a whole package that was just for different themes for ggplot. One of the big ones for that is ggthemes, so we'll look at some themes from that particular package. Using a theme is really easy. You create your ggplot object first, and then it becomes just one more layer that you add on. So let's look at an example of doing that with that Chicago data. In the first video in this chapter, I showed the example data sets that we'll use, and I put some code for that. So make sure that you run that and have everything set up. And if you do, you should have an object called Chic July. Sorry, it's not a tibble, so it's printing out everything instead of just the top, but let's look at just the beginning of it. There we go. So it has some elements like the date, some pieces, some columns where it's pulled out certain elements of that, and we won't use those much uh, right now. But it's also got the number of deaths on each day in Chicago, and this is the piece that we're going to be using in this example plot. So I want to create a scatter plot, a kind of time series, where I'm showing the date in, on the x-axis and then showing the number of deaths on the y-axis. So let's go up, and we can do ggplot. Our data is going to be the Chic July. And then we can do our aesthetics mapping. So I want x in this case to be to map to the date column, and then I want y to map to that death. All right, so we've got in now our data, we've got in our aesthetics mapping, and then our one other piece is we want to do a geom. You could do a line with this if you wanted to. In this case, I'll do points. I'll do geom point. So let's take a look at that. You can see over here in the plot window that this is exactly what we were hoping for, where we have the date along the x-axis, and then each point's position along the y-axis shows the number of deaths that day we can very clearly see that something really unusual happened in the middle of this month. This is using the default theme for ggplot, but now we can try adding some new themes. So the first one I'm showing here is the black and white theme. This is going to take that classic gray background and change it to a white background where the then instead of the kind of background grid being shown with white, it'll be shown with gray. So all you have to do for that is you go to your object and you add on this layer with a theme. So I'll do theme BW. Now when I run that, you can see that it's changed those background elements for the plot. The other thing I can point out in these slides, in this case, I am taking both of those plot objects and saving them to their own object names. And previously, Right here, I actually saved the ggplot to the chic plot name as well. And then to get these to show up side by side in my output, since these slides are kind of long, I've used this grid arrange. That lets you put in different ggplot objects by name. 
So this is bringing back A, which was a simpler pot, and B, where I've changed the theme. And then you use N call, that stands for number of columns, and that says that I want these organized for two columns. If I'd had four different objects I was putting in, because I said N call equals two, once it puts in two, it'll wrap around and add a new row and start adding new ones there. So this is a useful function. I'm not going to use it too much in the RStudio examples right now because we don't need to, but in these slides it was helpful for getting, for getting these side by side. Let's look at another example now. This one actually comes from the GG Themes package, and that package includes some themes named after some of those experts in visualization that I talked about in the slides for the very first le lecture for this chapter. This is named after Stephen Few, and you can see that again, we've really simplified things. It's, um, it's taken out that background, including the grid lines completely. So if we want that instead of this black and white theme, we can just go up to our theme and change it to that theme few. And you'll need to make sure that you have the GG themes library loaded before that will work. So we've got that over here, and, and that was, again, all it takes to change that was changing the theme that we add, that, that theme layer that we're adding there at the end. All right, this last one is using a Tufty theme. This is named after Edward Tufty. It's using the same kind of approach, and you can see in this case it's also changed the, the font size, and it's changed some of the features, like, like taken out the kind of box that goes around the plot area to leave a very sparse plot. You can even put in some themes that might be questionable choices. Like if you really want it to look like old school Excel, there is a theme Excel. I believe this is in GG themes as well. And so you can put that in and you can have what things look like when you were in high school using Excel if you're of my age.